Hey, thanks for tuning into the Art of SBA Lending. Today on the podcast, we have Nathan Walker. Nathan is an SBA underwriter with Fundex Solutions Group, and I am proud to say that Nathan is my underwriter. Well, he's not mine. I don't own him, but I do get jealous when he talks to other BDOs. Nathan underwrites all of the loans that come in through my network, and he does it in a way that is different than other underwriters I've worked with in the past. And he's proven to be very successful. So I thought it'd be a good idea to have him on and kind of share his approach with other underwriters in the industry. So stick around. And by the way, if you're a BDO, forward this to your underwriting team. You'll thank me later. Uh, so Nathan, the reason that you're on this, cause I, I don't, I don't let just anybody on this podcast, you know, you gotta be at a certain level. You gotta be a top producer, someone that has something of value. And I, I do think you have that cause you're an SP underwriter with us. You, you know, we work together. We're in the same goat pod and you know, you get the trophies, you get the accolades. Everyone wants to be like Nathan. Nathan does it better. Nathan does it faster. He's stronger. He's more chiseled. So congratulations. You've made it. Oh, thank you, bud. I appreciate that. I'm on a great team. I have a lot of help. So, and you're an all-star as well. So apparently we must, uh, they, they must uh, like putting us together. So we, we work out. That's why we're the goats, the goat That's pod. Right. And That's right. it's there's five of us and we have Linda, our closer, Alexa, our loan coordinator and Todd. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you've been at Fundex longer than I have. Right. I got there like late um, 2020, I think, like December. Sounds, sounds about right. So I'm June of 2020. And we we're a very young organization at that point. Tell me what it was like around that time. Uh, a very fragmented credit memo. We were just, uh, the um, the existing underwriters were just getting used to Abrigo. I had previous experience with Abrigo and uh, it was not much of a learning curve to sort of refresh my uh, myself with that. We were trying to implement a new workbook. Uh, we ended up implementing Roberts and so on and so forth. So very much growing pains, um, strategy. Yeah. Weren't you using an LSP at that point? We were for some. Yeah. For some deals. So yeah, were you the like the third credit were you the second underwriter or let's see we had katie we had sean and i want to say there was one more maybe oh and um a, a previous individual jen jen i believe so that was that was the initial team and did robert come after you he did i mean you guys were up about four underwriters and you know you had about the same bdos like number of bdos i feel like um so you guys were staffing up I guess waiting for me to come in and submit some deals because a lot of the shops do it the opposite. They get BDOs first. You'll have 10 BDOs, six BDOs, whatever, and like two underwriters and then start to add underwriters, which would create a lot more stress on someone like you. So, I mean, that's part of why, why I came here because they were, they were actually doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I came in like December as the fourth BDO that was there because it was, there was, Deb, Rick, and Ben were there as the BDOs before I got here. Um, so what was that like when I came in? Like, what was your first impression of me? <laughs> well, if you remember, we met uh, at the actual conference in 2019 and so on and so forth. And it's, ironically, I took, uh, when I was showing Alexa around where to check in and so on and so forth, I said, hey, that elevator right there, that's where Ray and I first met. And he was, the, you were the first person I met in the conference and uh, so on and so forth. And I I was so green to the SBA. Hell, I'm still green, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, my first impressions uh, of you, uh, of what I've already knew on LinkedIn and so on and so forth, were uh, someone highly sought after. You developed um, uh, a sufficient uh, referral source and uh, in, in a niche in regards to, and, we, we, and we've talked about this before, where you have a defined loan request to set. And I think that's... Uh, tremendously beneficial long-term from efficiency standpoint, scaling and so on and so forth. And how you can weed out the things that you can't, you don't really specialize in. And I think more BDOs and more individuals period should, should, uh, should operate that way. Yeah. It, it makes you more efficient. Um, you know, we look at a ton of business acquisitions. So 
we're in the mode of looking at business acquisitions. And we do some real estate purchases as well, but and partner buyouts. But I try to limit it to those three things because to switch gears and then all of a sudden underwrite a startup franchise, for example, going to be totally different sources and uses. You're looking at projections and a business plan more so than the historical financials. And it just takes you out of your rhythm. Yeah. And then a lot of times those uh, come with multiple multiple disbursements and so on and so forth. And that's its own uh, nightmare, uh, possibly. I mean, if we're not getting it right on the front end, and then we send it to uh, servicing and cl- closing and servicing. So, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, they're, they're night and day. So, yeah. So, part of your approach, and I think what makes you different than any other underwriter I've worked with, is your sense of urgency and attacking what's in front of you. Um, first of all, just walk me through your process for underwriting alone. Well, it's it's process, but it's also uh, mindset. Uh, sometimes I get a little bit of heat for this, but to me, everything's a race to the bottom. Everything. Uh, that's just a race I, to the bottom or a race to the finish. A race to the bottom. Who can do it the fastest and who, who can do it the cheapest? I mean, those who those who, who can do it in the corporate world are the winners. I mean, you can look throughout history uh, regarding that. Some people don't always, especially in the in the credit and risk departments and so on and so forth, when you're when you have that uh, type of job, uh, they don't always agree with me, but whatever. I mean, that's their opinion. They're entitled to it. But uh, so that's that's number one, urgency and so on. And so I mean, put yourself in the customer's shoes. I mean, they don't want to be sitting around. They've been working on this months and months prior and so on and so forth. And uh, they're spending money. And a lot of times they're risking some of the, their biggest assets or a great deal of their liquid net worth to achieve uh, what we're underwriting, basically. So also, I love it, period. Um when I'm underwriting, I want to underwrite. I want to dive in. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to get in. I, I don't want to stop. You get in, you get into a certain flow. You get into a certain, what I call, you start with the low hanging fruit after you, after you read whatever sort of write up you have presented business plan, your write up and so on and so forth. And the low hanging fruit would be inputting the credit report, trade lines, the PFS, uh, any sort of affiliate spreads and get a sense of, okay, you don't really know what the business is, what it sort of cash flow produces. You know the industry, you know it's relatively strong. If not, you wouldn't be seeing it. Uh, but business aside, you see, okay, who are the individuals who are purchased? What's their experience? Are they wealthy? Do they have a good payment history and so on and so forth. So you start to build the full picture, the full painting, if you will, of what is the loan request. And uh, it's just like everything else, peeling an onion. How do you need an elephant one bite at a time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really nothing more scientific than that. That's where it's, it, but it truly is an art and science. Yes. And here we tackle the art. Um, but what you just said is rare um, to find an underwriter with that sense of urgency. Some people might think that's more, you know, a BDO's um, kind of uh, DNA. But, you know, it <clears throat> you have it and you like underwriting. Why do you like underwriting so much? Is it because it's like a puzzle that you're trying to like figure out? Yes, I love the numbers aspect of it. I'm not really particularly great with numbers. Uh, I mean, I'm not a mathematician or anything like that. There's tons of things I struggled with in, in college and so on and so forth math wise. Uh, but I love what what the numbers represent. And it represents all things economics, all things uh, business and growth the uh, changing lives and so on and so forth. I mean, you think about someone who's been doing, uh, who's been operating in the corporate world, W2, for 15 or 20 years. They built up something substantial net worth-wise and they have some liquidity and they had a bad experience. And now they see this one particular opportunity that maybe they brought in some partners or a partner and they're risking everything. And to me, that's extremely important, but it's also important for us to get it right and I take pleasure in speaking with those individuals. So I like being I like being the person that can literally sit in the chair and just play with numbers all day, experiment, stress, and so on and so forth. And I get to talk to the person I'm literally lending the money to. That's a great uh, sort of a benefit that comes along with the job. And then also, uh, I'm it's not gra- really stressed. It's gratifying. Yeah. 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 And I'm not stressed. I don't, I don't, I very rarely feel stressed in the job and so on and so forth. Whereas in sales, I know sometimes it can be stressy. I know you, uh, stressing, excuse me. I know you work a great deal of hours. I truly feel like I have the easiest job in the world. Well, you make it look easy. And I want to get into the actual underwriting and also the um, process. And I guess we'll start with the actual underwriting. So 
when a deal hits your desk, now the way we do it, I, which I think is smart, is we credit manager or someone pre-screens what the BDO is um, putting out a proposal for so that by the time it hits your desk, you know at least somebody looked at it and has agreed that at the time they looked at it, there's a deal here. And mm. and if as long as it looks the same, we're probably going to approve it, um, but we just got to figure it out, d- dig in a little bit deeper. Um, so how do you make that initial assessment of basically agreeing that, yeah, there's a deal here? You develop certain uh, filters and, and things to look for in a particular loan request. And when you're, when you're looking over, say, the write-up and so on and so forth, or trying to take the holistic view of the deal, uh, you, could, you, can, you can figure out relatively quickly, maybe, maybe in an hour or so. I mean, you look at, you look at the general spreads, you look at, uh, obviously, debt service coverage, you look at the principals or the principal or the partners, whichever. You look at the industry, how long has the business been operating, how, how liquid are they, how experienced are they? I mean, education aside, I mean, you just develop uh, certain sort of identifiers, if you will. And, uh, and when you have all that together, you can say, okay, yeah, there's definitely something here. Let's go ahead and dive in. And then you start getting into uh, specifics of, of cash flow and, uh, and, and post-close liquidity, global, you know, all, the elig- all, the, all the material eligibility aspects of, of, of what SBA looks for. What's the, what's the first thing you open to start learning the deal? The write-up. The BDO right. write-up. The BDO write-up, yes. I like that answer. And, you know, a lot. most BDOs have to do some sort of write-up at some point before a deal goes into credit. And to know that underwriters are actually looking at that and the first that's their first impression. And I'm assuming the more detailed, the better. Oh, 100%. And so let's just imagine I'm looking at your write-up. I have my credit memo and I have a separate sheet where I will stack my questions. So as soon as I start reading something, I will start making questions. I will start reviewing the 1919s, CAVERS, OFAC statements, making sure all eligibility aspects, United States citizens, if not, so on and so forth, do we have the applicable documentation that follows, and so on and so forth. And you just, you, you over, this, over the uh, course of the first hour or so, you start to uh, develop the picture that is, that is the loan request. And one thing leads to another, you start writing on the business history, uh, you start looking at resumes, you start looking at uh, the business tax returns, interim financial statements, you name it, across the board, and um, you complete the loan. BDOs will go different levels of like how deep they're going to go into that write-up. There, you know, Some don't like to go very deep, some like to go very, very deep. But you, know, you can miss a glaring issue if you don't go deep enough. Uh, has that ever happened where you know, a BDO just missed something very big or, or, or big enough to impact the decision. And, and then it gets to you and then they're trying, and then you're trying to basically fix it after it's already gotten to you. And it just sets things off onto a, like a rocky path. Does that ever happen? Not with me, but like with other people. Never, never. Uh, not from a qualitative standpoint, from a quantitative, we can miss a debt. We could fat finger a particular ad bag or an EBITDA number or, or uh, a book net income number that can materially change a particular day, especially in a, in a most recent interim period in the last fiscal year, and uh, which are the qualifying uh, coverage um, periods. Uh, but from a qualitative standpoint, not really. Uh, the only thing I would say to any sort of media and also to underwriting detail is always key. So as much as many questions as you can come up with, in the longer you do this and the more questions you ask, you realize what's material versus what's not. And you start to, it, it just becomes ingrained. So, you know, automatically, imagine someone walks up to you, Ray, in Clearwater, they know you, they want to start a business or they want to buy a business. You know, automatically what's going to come, the first things they need to start working on and what you're going to be asking. Okay, is this guy, are they a joke or are they legit? And that's, and that's what asking questions and, and digging into the loan request, digging into the business, suppliers, customers, market, industry, turn time, cash cycles, you name it, uh, input cost, why, why, are, why are margins moving in this direction, why they spike, why they fall, so on and so forth. And you just um, and you start putting it on paper. A lot of times what I'll find is, particularly on a borrower interview, I'll just ask. I'll just start. Talk, we'll just start talking, and I'll ask anything and everything that pops up to my mind, and so on and so forth. And I'll be making notes. And then when I'm doing the final write-up, uh, everything starts to piece together. All the details start to come together, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and so from a, from a processing standpoint, I just imagine, I mean, just assume you were not able to talk to anybody. You couldn't talk to the BDO, you couldn't talk to the customers, the loan coordinator couldn't talk to you, the closer couldn't talk to you. All you had was your write-ups and your credit memo. And that's how that's what you have to go off on. You have to make a decision, you have to close it. So imagine what sort of level of detail that would take. Right. And that's that's the detail you want. Interesting. Yeah. And and so you're and getting into process, your your process is a little bit unique. Um, one thing you're known for is when you're on the bar or interview, you do tend to go a little long. But I will say that you often complete the the entire loan within like a day of that call and you're not going back because that's what people hate back and forth. All right, I did this and then here's five more questions. Here's five more questions. So, um, so I'm not saying that's, uh, wrong, but, um, why do you, I guess, what's your kind of, um, strategy in um, having such a detailed, um, borrower interview? Is it so that you can just knock everything out all on one call? 100%. And when, when when my credit memo goes to the next process, I prefer that there are no, no, no required questions that need to come back to me, period. Whether it's regarding disbursements, whether it's regarding closing, whether it's come from my manager, the chief of credit, the CEO, chief risk officer, you name it. That the less questions, the more detailed I am, the more questions that I can ask, the more time I can spend reviewing the numbers, uh, but there's also a limit to that as well. But the more time within a certain, say, time frame of three days, three days is really my my sort of max. I mean, ideally it would be one day, but one to, one to three days is depending on the loan request is is what I shoot for. So I want all of that done within that time frame. And the more the more time I can spend on the file, the more questions I can ask, and so on and so forth, and better deliver that 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 higher level detail. Well, and I, I always say whatever you're doing is working because, you know, in a world of metrics, you know, you you blow probably most other underwriters out of the water in terms of just productivity and efficiency. And not every again, not every underwriter is going to have that sort of mentality. It's hard to to learn that. It's almost like some people are just born with this type of mentality. But, you know, it's not impossible to have a mind, you know, shift your mind. But like it's hard. But there's some takeaways like that they can implement today to if they're looking to shave off a day from their average turnaround time like there's things they can do like for example in terms of process you get the loan file you let everyone know right away i've you know i've i've uh begun this review um here's what's on my plate here's what this is looking like in terms of time frame you're you're keeping that communication going which is huge that's a big part um and then you're t- trying to set up the borrower interview after you've gotten, um, you know, comfortable with the file and you have some questions and whatnot. Now, here's what you do that no other underwriter does in terms of Uh-oh. just Here's trying to get the borrower on the phone. You don't want to delay. As soon as you're ready, you want to have that interview. Let's say it's tomorrow. You, we, we're, we're emailing the borrower, we're texting the borrower, you're emailing Alexa to call the borrower and you're calling me to tell the borrower, let's get on the phone and do this thing. And then like 30 minutes will go by and you'll be like, hey, uh, I'm waiting, uh, let's do this. That type of sense of urgent, most underwriters would send an email and say, hey, I'd like to set a call here sometimes, let me know. And maybe they don't respond or they miss it and there's no follow up and you've just lost three days. That's something underwriters can do. I've never seen anyone do anything like that before. Picking up the phone, texting, calling. Uh, that's unique. <laughs> when did you start implementing that? I would probably say that the texting is recent uh, because of our whole email process and so on and so forth. But again, it goes back to the urgency. One, two, three days, anything more than that, something is something is off. <clears throat> And putting myself in the customer's shoes. I mean, that that is truly all it is. Now, I will say there's a little asterisk there. Uh, I am ex- I have been extremely fortunate um, that <clears throat> my wife doesn't have to work. I can get up in the morning. I don't sleep a lot. So some mornings I'll get up at, at three or four, do whatever sort of workout. And I can come to my desk at five, five thirty or six. And you just start. Just start. Just do it. 
Uh, yeah. And there's nothing more than that. I, I don't typically take a lot of lunches. Again, sometimes that's frowned upon, especially in, in today's age, around being uh, burned out, possibly, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I, I've always said this is what I tell uh, younger individuals, whether the underwriters are going into to some completely opposite field, is, is just do what you love. And because you're going to be spending more time doing whatever work that you end up doing, more than you spend with your family, so on and so forth, on average. And, um, and so pick something you love. And uh, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell this story depending on the time we have, but um, prior to breaking into commercial underwriting, I spent five years buying subprime auto loans. I won't give the company's name or whatnot, but it was a wonderful company. Uh, when I started, it was 2013. I didn't have any children at the time. My wife and I had been married a year. She was working, I was working. Everything was great, bonuses. Uh, uh, incentives and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it really was something something great to springboard. But for those five years, I was trying to break into commercial underwriting. Uh, I got repeatedly turned down, no chances, no phone interviews, no nothing. And, and finally, let's see, in, in May of 2018 or so, uh, one individual, and he knows his name, uh, gave me a chance. And I didn't ask what the pay was. It wasn't really a technically an underwriting job. It was a credit analyst position. I didn't ask what the position was. Something opened up. He turned me down uh, fr- on a Friday, called me back on a Monday, saying literally wh- when we got off the phone, uh, one individual gave his notice, opened up some uh, some budgeting aspect. It was a small community bank at this time. And uh, called me Monday. I was on my way to lunch. He said, hey, I got a position. As he said, it's, it's what you're looking for. I didn't ask the title. I didn't ask the pay. I said, let's do it. I haven't looked back since. That's incredible. Dude, that's what I'm talking about. Because people that are hiring, I don't know. They, I feel like a lot of these people just do a poor job uh, because they're looking for, have you been an underwriter before, essentially? that's probably your, That was probably your biggest thing. I don't know if anyone's asking you what time you get to your desk in the morning because no one's asking Nathan to get to his desk at 5 a.m., but yeah, I, the amount of emails I got from you before 7 a.m. in the past year is uh, when I'm still in bed, you know, I mean, it's it, it's not like the time you could hey you could work any time of the day if you want in this position. But like the fact that you do that and no one has to tell you, I mean, just it just goes to who you are and, and the fact that you want to be the best at what you do. You know, some people like yourself, they want to be the best at what they do. And, and that's what drives you to just keep getting better and better. So these are types of traits that I think you can't learn as easily, nearly as easily as you can learn underwriting. Take a few, uh, take a few Nagel classes, and uh, you know you'll get up to speed. Uh, you know, I'm oversimplifying, but still, you know, somebody took a risk on you and it paid off. Yeah, one hundred percent. I and I haven't forgotten it either. Uh, and there's a couple other uh, individuals that are responsible for me being here today, and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, I, I would I, I say that. Um, the, the technical side of underwriting, someone can learn relatively quickly. I mean, anyone can calculate cash flow after, after you after you do it a couple of times and collateral uh, advances and exposure and things of that nature, global calculations. And but but the art that comes into it is is, is what really is developed over time. And I remember my first couple of credit memos; they were just horrible, horrible. And uh, someone who's been doing it twice as long as I've been doing, they probably look at my credit memo and say, "This is horrible. This is horrible." Um, but and that's OK. Uh, I have no problem listening to someone who's who's been doing this longer than I have and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, the, the art of it is, is what really, I think, uh, drives me. And then but also I still love the numbers, too. So the ability to learn is really the key there. Like if you're someone who has the want and desire and ability to learn, that's another trait that, you know, people are not when they're hiring, they're not really asking or trying to figure out the right types of questions a lot of the time because you had you had all the pieces and in hindsight, people can see it. But, you know, um, a lot of folks in our industry just want to see on the resume that you've done it before and that you're plug and play and, and not give that additional effort to get somebody. But that's how you create an all stars. That's what we try to do here. We're trying to identify talent and bring on all stars, but but really create all stars, give people a chance. Um, we're doing that you know, across many different, um, you know, divisions here. The art of the borrower interview. That's what I have written here because some BDOs are very afraid for the underwriter to talk to the customer. And honestly, some underwriters are very bad at it. Mm -hmm. They could come off confrontational. 
and they're also just sometimes not used to talking to people. You do a good job though. Explain what your whole thought process is around how you attack that kind of borrower interview, as we call it, the, the call that you have with the customer to iron out all your questions and just learn more about the business. Right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, first and foremost, what I tell under, other underwriters is you need to own the call. I mean, it's your call. There's no need to be a jerk about it. There's no need to, uh, to come off as pretentious or um, uh, all knowing or anything of that nature. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, yes, you are the underwriter, but if you, again, if you put yourself in the customer's shoes and you try to relate to them as much as possible and just be real with them, talk to them. This is what I see in the numbers. Talk to me about your, uh, about your experience. Why do you want to buy the business? Relate to them. Um, if they start talking about any particular fears or concerns, uh, basically tear down the walls. So, uh, to give you an actual process, when I when I begin each and every call, I'll say, are there any questions? Do you have any questions for me? And I always thank them and try to build some rapport, talk about maybe where they're located or if they currently work in a company or corporation that's, you know, maybe in the news every now and then, maybe on CNBC or something, I can bring up something like that. Uh, and it just, just like in a real interview, you know, you start to you relax a little bit. Um, but you just you, you try to relate to them as much as possible, as quickly as possible. They open up and they're truthful and they they they, they start answering your questions in high detail. And, but again, it goes back to the fundamentals. If if you have a particular question and they didn't and you don't quite understand, just be real with them. Be real with them and say, look, you're because some of our bars are very skilled. Uh, they're very technical and they're very smart, way smarter than I am which doesn't take much, but, um, and sometimes they'll respond to something in a particular industry. And I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. I'll say, look, guys, that just w- went way over my head. I don't know what you're talking about. So bear with me because I'm typing at the same time. And can you please explain that again? Like you're talking to a six-year-old. Um, and so I, I'd say a lot of times when a bar would hear that, that there's something they could teach me, uh, that would that would probably that probably helps build rapport and so on and so forth. It makes everybody uh, it makes the process just better. Yeah, because a lot of them are very nervous and intimidated to talk to you, Nathan. But you do a good well, job getting them comfortable, and that's when you, they really open up. And some BDOs are in the school of thought that I want to be on the call. Um, I want to jump in and speak on behalf of the bar, where or a broker would do something similar. Um, the best way to do it is to let you. And I, I've maybe been on one of the calls. Other than that, I let you run and do whatever. Um, but having the other writer and the borrower just talk, um, because if there truly is a problem or the borrower really doesn't know what they're talking about, then you know you want to uncover that before you approve the loan. So it's not right to like want to uh, referee it or whatever if you have to because you can't do that for their business for the whole repayment of the loan. So. Right. Let's talk about the other big thing with, is expectation setting, which is something you very big on, um, you know, setting and ex- then exceeding expectations. I mean, even today. So we have a deal right now, um, 4.2 million business acquisition. And um, we just rolled out a new uh, loan operating system like two weeks ago. You know, huge game changer for us. But, you know, the <laughs> The first one, you have to kind of work out the kink. So it's like, I mean, it, everyone, this is a well-known system. Most people are using it. Um, I think we've kind of built out a, a little bit cooler version of it. But nonetheless, um, it's a learning curve. And so <laughs> you get to have the first approval through this uh, LOS, right? Yeah, we just, uh, that happened today and so on and so forth. There's other loans in underwriting, but yeah, this was the first A to Z and then uh, producing a, a CM and a CL and going through the chain of command, which is interesting. But You know, we send deals over 3 million to committee, which that's like, a, it's, I mean, it's not a your traditional committee where I'm going in and doing a presentation for a board, right? I mean, it's how, how did it work? Uh, what was the process from the time you finished your underwriting to getting it approved? Well, we send it to, we send just a PDF version of the, of the output, the CM uh, and CNO's output uh, to the chief of credit. She reviews it, makes any sort of recommendations, uh, which is always the case. Uh, so I tell the underwriter, other underwriters to be open-minded and just be patient. Uh, she will 
she will make a recommendation, send it back to me, we'll discuss, and so on and so forth. And then it goes to the chief risk officer and then uh, the chief executive as well. So the level of experience can sometimes make individuals nervous from the from the credit standpoint. Uh, but if you just change your mindset just a little bit and say they're not necessarily, I mean, 100% they're not attacking you, uh, but it, it's just their experience when they read through your data and your and your write-up and so on and so forth, it's just screaming at them, well, let's think about this, let's change this uh, language, let's change this wording right here because they may be escalators or they may lead uh, down to a particular path that uh, you don't you don't want uh, to, to, to happen. So on the committee deals, everyone knows that there's added scrutiny and you got to button it up a little bit tight tighter. But I mean, you I mean, you guys circulated this probably what, like within the last 24 hours and we got an approval. 24. Yeah. 24 hours. That's, that's a fair. And that's it was like done through email. Like there was no no one got on a call or anything. Right. I right. mean, you and the chief credit officer probably went on a call, but but just to get it buttoned up to then circulate to the team. So that honestly, and to get to the point where you, so so I submitted it to underwriting 12 business days ago and you started working on it, you know, a few days after that. The following day, actually, because I had nothing else on my plate. Uh, I was all caught up with closings and so on and so forth. So we, I was intentionally making sure my, my plate, uh, if you will, was clear for that. For that particular day, it was a Monday, uh, sometime in the afternoon. I was cleaning up everything. Uh, Alexa advised uh, that the loan was ready for review. So Tuesday morning, rocking and rolling, and so on and so forth. So. This is what's so cool to me. All right, so it took about two weeks to underwrite and approve a four point two million dollar deal. First of all, unheard of. Second of all, just the fact that we got it approved. I mean, it's a uh, unsecured exposure. Um, you know, it's not something a lot of banks get comfortable with, uh, cause there's not a lot of collateral. It's cash flow. Cash flow is good. Good deal. Just not a lot of collateral and that's fine for us. And then the fact that you did it while we were rolling out and going through this testing and improving or whatever, I mean, it were live, but like there's still kinks that we're working out. So, um, incredible day. And, and so what'd you tell me today? You said, we're hoping to have an approval by Friday, right? Right, right. Yeah, that, I mean, that that's the expectation to be conservative. So uh, I completed all the conversations I, need to, I needed to have with the two borrowers last Friday. And I said, look, guys, we're going through a new platform change. It's got to go up the chain of command. Um, so let's just be real here. I hope to have a decision for you by end of business uh, a week from now. And they were 100% on board with that. They realized these guys are experienced and so on and so forth. So uh, we were, again, we were, as I said earlier, we were fortunate that they, we had the unstressed time frame that those two individuals uh, allowed for us. But yeah, the two weeks, um, it, yeah, a lot of that was um, fixing the plane in the air, as I would say. Um because we were literally underwriting, adding comments and so on and so forth. And sometimes your comments were lost uh, and you had to uh, sort of retrieve them somehow, so on and so forth. The data was getting mixed um, and so on, and, and things of that nature. So um, ideally, it really should have been five business days, to be honest with you. Um, even if I could have gotten the guys on the phone uh, a little bit earlier, there were, there were a couple of days of basically, what would you call it, uh, silent air, if you will. Uh, they were they were out of pocket and um, there was really nothing, no more uh, analysis I could do, no more uh, write up I could do. So, uh, I mean, you can knock off two business days. You there. lost a couple of days because of because of them. But still, this is why you're unique. You're beating yourself up on a deal that you we didn't uh, from my sta- from my time standpoint. Um, what I say, 12 business days. I normally tell people on a three million plus deal that has to go through full committee approval, I say. 10 to 15 business days. So the Friday that you we're sitting here on a Wednesday, Friday would have been about the 15 business days, which is exactly what I told them would have been fine, but we're delivering it two days earlier than everyone expected on a Wednesday. And that's incredible, but you're still not completely happy with yourself. And, (laughs) but that's makes you who you are. You know, you want to, you, you want to hit numbers and get better, but you did great. So I don't, this was a big win. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I and I, I have everybody in mind, and I, uh, as part of the evolution of, of an experienced underwriter, I did not do that when I was when I was younger or less experienced. Uh, when I first started out, I did not 
put the BDO's uh, mindset first and foremost. I did not. I did not think about the closers. I only thought about me and getting it right and how my write, my write up uh, was going to be presented to the the um, uh, the chain of command and so on and so forth. And so nowadays, when I'm underwriting, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about your reputation. I'm thinking about all the work you've done with the borrowers and what what sort of expectations you've uh, set up for them. And and when I had them on the phone, I don't want to do anything to disrupt. Uh, your referral source, that relationship. Um, so that's there's a couple of things I've gotten better at uh, being holistically um, a better, a better, well-rounded underwriter, which incorporates all of that against the art and science, and that's that's part of the art of it. Well, and that's what we've been doing with the pod structure, because it's a lot easier when you have one underwriter, one closer, one BDO, and one loan coordinator, um, because we're all taking that approach now where I'm thinking about you. And when this gets to you, that's why we've implemented certain things. You know, I don't want to give away all our secrets, but we've been implemented certain things so that it's more smooth transition to underwriting and then from underwriting to closing, et cetera, and even closing to servicing. Um, so, but you know, a lot of underwriters are doing something very wrong right now and, and they should realize that. And that's, I'll have it for you tomorrow. And then tomorrow goes by and, and the BDO has to say, or the customer has to say, Hey, what happened? You know, all right, no, I'm sorry. I'll do it. I, I will get it done tomorrow. You know, if you would have just told me, you know, I'll have it done in three days and deliver it in two days. It's a small thing, but it just makes a huge difference. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me ask you this question. It's always on my mind. And I don't know if you're going to give me the right answer or not, but I, I, I encourage you to be 100% truthful here for, for the listeners. Um, when a deal comes, and this wouldn't be now because you only pretty much underwrite my deals, but you know, when you were underwriting like a bunch of different videos deals at once, like, would you have a different impression of the deal based on who it came from in terms of the BDO? Yes. In what way? How prepared are they? What's their experience? I mean, once I once I develop some sort of uh, interpret not interpretation, but some sort of once I uh, have some sort of experience with a particular video, yeah, I mean, you will you will have uh, a certain mindset about a particular person and how they work, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, one thing I used to do when I was younger, which was uh, sort of in poor taste, is when you're when you're buying subprime loans, a lot of times you have to build relationships with uh, finance managers at the dealership. And if anybody's ever bought a car and you finance and so on and so forth, and you know how that, you know how pushy they can be and so on and so forth, and they want things done quickly and they want to make money themselves and so on and so forth. And I used to say, hey, so-and-so didn't like the way you spoke to them or they're not, they didn't like uh, the way you're doing this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. And I used to say, look, I treat everybody the same. I talk to everybody the same. I have the same sort of approach to every single uh, every single finance manager, sales rep, you name it. So well, you can't do that. Not everybody is the same. You can't talk to person A the same you would talk to B, so on and so forth. And uh, I've gotten better at that as I get a little bit older. And uh, again, going back to answer your question, just because I have certain expectations from you, uh, say versus a junior BDO or someone who's been doing it for two or three years, not 10 years or eight years versus 10 years or 10 years versus 20 years. It's not a bad thing. As long as you can adapt to that particular writing style, maybe that, that, that personality, uh, maybe any sort of uh, inefficiencies they have and so on and so forth. And that just comes with time and how comfortable you are with the process, the products and so on and so forth, the SBA, SOP in, in general. So again, Yes, to answer your question. Well, and that's a very diplomatic and and fair and reasonable response. Um, I will just say, and we probably haven't experienced it here because we have a fairly young team, but a very solid team. But um, I've definitely seen people that have 20, 25 years of experience as a BDO and an underwriter will like roll their eyes when their deal comes in because it's just like being thrown against the wall. Um, Now, I will not to cut you off now, I will say I'm actually glad you brought that up. Based on my experience, the only time that 
I myself, where I've seen other underwriters roll their eyes or get a bad taste in their mouth whenever they know they're getting ready to be assigned a file from a particular BDO, is uh, one or a couple of things. The BDO doesn't communicate well. They have ego. They're hard to work with, and they don't they don't have they don't have the, the, the people, the product, and the process mindset down. Marcus Lemona says that. Every time he work, he's on CNBC, every time he uh, visits a business owner, people, product, and process. And so if a BDO has an attitude, has an ego, uh, we don't need to ask this question or everything in my write-up is all you need to know. Uh, they get an attitude whenever an underwriter may have a question or so on and so forth. That's that's when, in my opinion, BDOs kind of roll their eyes. And that that's just that's not a relationship that is success, uh, successful successful for efficiencies, for scales, however you want to call it. Um, and so if you, but if you have, if, I mean, just like anything else, if you have someone who's open-minded, you say, yeah, that's a great question. Let's let's get on the phone with uh, A and Z and find that out and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the, the walls of communication, there are none. That to me goes, goes a long ways and so on and so forth for any sort of skill set. And uh, I would say, if you have a particular individual, and it doesn't have to be in sales, it could be in credit, it could be in a closing, it could be in loan coordinating, a loan coordinating, excuse me, that may have some sort of inefficiencies or maybe green or something, but their willingness, their willingness to learn is there. They're open minded. They can take feedback, and they don't they don't get an attitude, and they just learn from it, and move on. That makes that makes that makes all the difference. So, yeah, and transparency, and um, you know, trust and truthfulness, and and just. From a BDO standpoint, just you know, shedding a light on any sort of negativity in the deal and just explaining what it is and why the deal still makes sense versus trying to cover it up or you know, you get caught in a lie or something like that, you're just done as a BDO. You know, if you lose the trust of your credit team, you're you're just done. Yeah, I mean, just like with anything else, if you're hard to work with, and I've experienced this myself, I've I've been the guy that's been hard to work with when I was younger and so on and so forth. I mean, it took me years to learn not to be you know what to your co-workers whether you call it ego you already knew this or i've already stated this somewhere uh, so i've been that guy and i can't believe that i wasn't uh fired uh more as, as, as when i was younger and it's true it's true so i've been that person so i know i know what it's like to be a defensive individual or to someone that gets upset if, if you question what i have documented i've been that guy and, and no one wins no one wins when you're that person so again just to sort of uh, reiterate, if you have a BDO, no matter their skill set, I've never seen I've never seen an underwriter not like a particular person because they're not good at something. It's only because they're hard to work with, and you, and you make the pro you make the process uh, basically inefficient and not fun. No one wins. Nathan, you dropped a lot of wisdom bombs today. <laughs> Appreciate well, that. Well, well, we'll see after the call, right? What sort of reactions you get? <laughs> Oh yeah, this will definitely go viral. I think I think all the ladies are going to be commenting. Oh lord! <laughs> um, and by the way, just for the record, we do let Nathan take lunches. Uh, that is true. his prerogative. Very true. Very true. <laughs> I don't want very to get true. you know the employment lawyers after me. No, 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 no. no. It, it's it's very hard for anybody. When I say anybody, any corporation right now, any business to top fund X, to top BHG. From my perspective, from what from what I what I value. I, that's all I'll say. I, all. No, I agree, man. They're doing a good job and making a concerted effort to uh, take care of their employees. And um, oh, yeah. I came here in large part because of the culture. Oh, um, yeah. Hard to hard to find. It's yeah, a big part of great, it. Well, yeah, we have a great work-life balance. And so hey, maybe we can become part recruiters on this video as well. So, Dude, honestly, you have no idea. But yeah, first of all, yeah, for... Anyway, I I don't want to get into it. Let's let me just wrap. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I I appreciate you uh, coming on today. I'll see you at work. Yes, yes, sir. I, I appreciate it, Ray. This this was fun. This was cool. So, uh, cheers to you and and uh, cheers to uh, Fundex and so on and so forth. So, thanks. Thank you. All right, man. See ya. See you, bye. Bye. All right, that's it for this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode of The Art of SBA Lending. And if you have any feedback or suggestions, email me at ray at artofsba.com. Until next time, ta-ta.